the DNC, DNC I remember uh, Simone Sanders on, um, on MSNBC one day saying, there are not going to be debates. We have right. our candidates. Yep. There are not going to be debates. And one of the things that uh, Jen Kuger has said quite a lot, by suppressing our candidacies, they have given all the oxygen to the Republicans. Yeah. All the oxygen to the Republicans. Brilliant guys, genius. What geniuses came out with that? Oh. So it's like Jerrica and Dean have said: when we speak, we talk the Democratic line. And they have said, nope, nobody's going to do that until until Biden chooses to give a talk. And Kamala Harris is not. People are going to be thinking: well, when I vote for an 81-year-old, it's reasonable to consider the possibility yeah. that the vice president will take over at some point. The majority of Americans would be going, mm-mm. Right. Another brilliant move on their part that they think it's also cosmetic. Hey guys, wishing you a warm yet cold hello from New Hampshire. This time I went from Keene, drove in the middle of the snow to get to Dover, New Hampshire to check out Marion Williamson, who is running for the Democratic nomination for president, along with Dean Phillips and somewhat of a joke candidate, Cenk Uger, against President Biden. So interesting experience. Wanted to talk about that. First things first, some of you watched the lives, the, the live stream of her event, and I failed you with it because I later checked it out. There are a few comments saying they couldn't hear. I didn't know if it was just for one or two phones. Uh, but the audio sucked. The audio was terrible. That's completely my fault, which is strange because the, the audio for the live stream of the Trump rally was good. And the audio for the live stream of the Dean Phillips event was also good. But yet with Nikki Haley, I mean, not Nikki Haley, with Marion Williamson, it was not. So I apologize for that. Uh, I'm incredibly broke. I need to invest in a, uh, cell phone microphone as well as a microphone for my DSLR camera, but uh, I'm kind of running on empty fumes. I, I haven't made any of a push for the last four months about uh, uh, trying to get support, but I was thinking about setting up a Patreon if you want to help out because I would love to get that microphone. Uh, and there's a GoFundMe thing on on uh, the home page of my YouTube if you're interested because it'd be cool to get that. But I will get a microphone within probably about a week, give or take, regardless, so the sound will be better. But thank you guys for bearing with me. That being said, I filmed the entire uh, Town Hall of Mary and Williamson, the entire event, also on my DSLR camera, which had much better sound. So if you'd like me to re-upload that, I have that entire event on my DSLR camera with better sound if there's some interest. But you'll certainly see some clips and my analysis with her event today. So first things first, uh, Dean Phillips, about 150 people attended his event. At this event for Mary and Williamson, only about six people showed up. Uh, so not not a good attendance whatsoever. And I, I can tell you what that feeling is like. I actually ran for office when I was younger. I was about 18 years old. And I ran for New York City Council, dropped out before petitioning season. And then I ran for an unpaid office in New York City called State Committee. And there I lost only about, uh, by only about 5%. But I certainly have had many events where five people show up. Now I was running for a smaller office, but it's really awkward. You, you kind of try to figure out how to deal with people and, and how you're going to communicate in that event. And to Marianne, uh, in Marianne's defense, the, the weather was really quite bad the moment she had her event. And her event was at 3.30 p.m., on a Tuesday. So as somebody unemployed, that sounds great. I could sleep in and then show up to that event. But for people who have jobs, uh, 3.30 on a Tuesday doesn't really work. Plus, again, the weather was, I, I think I almost skidded off the road about three times, but luckily I did not. It was about a two hour, three, it was supposed to be a two hours, about a three hour drive from Keene out to Dover. And I was driving right in the middle of the snowstorm. So I, I saw firsthand how bad the conditions were. Roads closed. So we'll give her some credit, but if you're looking at who draws bigger crowds and a little more attention, Dean Phillips certainly has the victory. But this is why watching this town hall is interesting because Marianne kind of explains why her specifically, even more so than Dean Phillips, is getting blacked out of the conversation and how there's this media blackout that is uniquely focused towards Marianne Williamson. Yes, Dean Phillips is certainly getting a bit of that, and I get that, uh, but they're going a lot harder on Marianne about this. And the reason that 
they're trying to black out Marianne even more so than Dean Phillips is because Marianne is the ultimate shake it up, challenge the status quo, uh, look under the hood and expose true governmental corruption, expose how the gov- uh, how the, the Democratic Party is trying to fix the primaries, expose how our uh, economic system is rigged. Uh, and one of her great lines, which I really, really thought was a, was a, a good line, is she said, you can't you can't have a democracy when you don't have a thriving middle class. And so I think she's bringing up a lot of new, unique issues. She talked about environmental genocide, the issues of East Palestine, the issues in with water in Jackson, Mississippi, as well as Flint, Michigan, and bringing up all these very specific points and saying there, that there needs to be a dramatic overhaul. She also wants to restructure her uh, presidential appointment. She wants somebody, which it might, might sound silly, but it's actually not, somebody who is the Secretary of Peace, meaning instead of uh, what we have now, which are these very trigger-happy people in foreign policy, she wants to end all the foreign entanglements and make peace the priority of her administration. If you think we've been in foreign entanglements for the past 20 years since the Iraq war, and you think it might end with Afghanistan or, or Iraq, but look at all the investment in the Ukraine. Look at, at the, the mess in Israel and all the money that we're giving. For better, for worse, a lot of people would say for worse, it could be better spent here at home uh, helping the middle class thrive or helping people become middle class. And obviously Ukraine is an issue and now Yemen. And it's just one after another. So I think that I think she's deliberately receiving this blackout because she is an excellent communicator and she's somebody that is quite inspiring to listen to. This is actually my second time I've been to a Marianne Williamson event back in 2019. I also checked her out when she was running back then. This is her second time running for office. And I was always really charmed by her and always thought she was kind of down to earth and and had this bigger picture message. Uh, th- this uh, uh, had a theme that was kind of different than the other candidates and ideas that were unique that could actually benefit this country and benefit the middle class. And I, I think I think Phillips uh, is a very good candidate. I think she's even more talented and more charismatic than Phillips. And, you know, this is this is a stupid aside, but if you look at image quality of a candidate, you know, I'll admit uh, uh, Marianne is kind of my candidate crush. She's very attractive. Tulsi Gabbard was my candidate crush last time in 2020, uh, but very attractive, uh, appears well on TV, uh, is somebody that's I think she's somebody that somebody's just viewers if they got a chance to actually watch her just like watching her whether it be for her speaking style for the visuals whatever it might be she is a very good general election candidate in more ways than one in image and policy on issues in her stump speech and her ability to inspire people uh, she'd be I think she'd mop the floor with Trump but of course uh, take a look at what she is saying because right here she gives she gives a kind of play by play process as to how the Democratic National Committee uniquely shut her out. That was the biggest damage of their not putting me on mainstream TV. Right. We've raised a fraction, we've only raised half of what we raised last time in the same period of time because I was on CNN. I had a CNN town hall. I was on MSNBC. I mean, they. I it, it, so many people say, I talk to my friends, they don't even know you're running. And then here, you'll you'll hear the voice in the background. That's me asking her the question. It was a fun event because, and this is why I respect Marianne tremendously. Even though it's only like seven people, she could have in her campaign said, hey, do you want to take a nap or relax or go back or do some other stuff? She said, no, y'all, you guys came here to, to see me. And Marianne Williamson for two hours just kind of shot the shit with, with these seven, with, with these seven other people. And it was kind of great. We just, it was as if I was talking to somebody who was a friend of mine. I don't really get that experience with a candidate. I'm going to a Nikki Haley event tomorrow. I'm guaranteed not to get that experience. But it speaks volumes about Marianne. And as somebody personally who has run for office, I could I could affirmatively say the way you interact with voters on the stump and on the campaign trail is the way you will treat your constituents if you get to be president of the United States. What that means is, are you running away from voters when they want to take a photo with you, or do you actually stop and chat and ask them about something? That that was a problem about DeSantis. DeSantis, you can tell he just doesn't like people. He'd run away, he'd cut them off mid-sentence if they're trying to talk to him. And Marianne was just the complete opposite. She had a tremendous respect for the people that were coming to see her and allocated the two hours just just for all of us to kind of talk 
And I think, talk about a president who is accessible. Marianne Williamson is the will be the most accessible president if she's elected. Now, I think being elected is a tough one. Uh, you know, I kind of felt for her and, and lent her my sympathy. Um, it's going to be a tough slog, I think. But as you can see, uh, you'll hear my voice asking her a question. As you can see, she got a lot more mainstream press in 2019 when it was an open field versus now. So I asked her why she wasn't on Pod Save America. Pod Save America is one of the most popular left-leaning podcasts that's run by Obama alumni. And Dean Phillips was on Pod Save America, but Marianne wasn't. And this is a problem she's been ru ru been running into frequently. Another great example, Face the Nation. Marianne Williams had a great interview on Face the Nation in 2019. This time around, they have not invited her on, but they did invite Dean Phillips. So same thing, Pod Save America, they had Dean Phillips on but they did not invite Marianne. So there's, Dean Phillips is also getting a blackout and I think he's a quality candidate as well, but Marianne is getting twice the blackout, twice the media blackout that Dean Phillips is receiving. So there's something very unfair here. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it, that, I, I don't even like that, that they're talking about. I mean, I, I think he has a good campaign. I don't even like that they're talking about him more than you on occasion. The mainstream media, the, the, the you know, social media is the complete opposite. Uh, you know, the fact that I think he went on Pod Save America. How, how come Pod? That's a question I've never. Have you tried connecting to like Pod Save America? How come they, they keep like on, flipping you off? They had me on last time. Okay, they. Right, right. They in in 2019, right? He mentioned me uh, and said uh, she's just doing it for clout. I mean, this is the. But they have Dina. Say, it's like. When people say I'm doing this for ego, I want to ask yeah. you how you think waking up every morning yeah, to right. the insults, to the bad <laughs> to the condescension, right. to the lies, to the smear. To the need to raise money, to need to put right. in my own money. How do you think this is any good for your ego? Right. Yeah. This is so not yeah, an ego not choice. This yeah. is the most humbling. Like I said, I walked in here today. Yeah. If, I mean, I'm used to a career. So, so here, it's free. Nobody will come. But if I was, if I was talking about personal growth and relationships and stuff. It would be full, and people would pay fifty dollars each. So some people would say, "Isn't that a sign to stay in that career?" I understand, but for whatever reason, it hasn't felt that that's the sign. Well, you've had four decades of helping people. It's a logical next step. Yeah, that's how it feels you know? to me. Yeah. yeah. And I think people realize that she could speak to voters in the way that Trump can, ironically, but in a kinder and gentler way, where it's, this system is not working, break it all down, but instead of villainizing immigrants and villainizing the other, it's bringing people together. Let's appoint specific people in our cabinet that strengthens the middle class, that strengthens our foreign policy and our standing abroad, and that gives us peace. And let's just rethink the way we appoint people, the way we interact with our constituents. And then finally, here's a little bit, which is really interesting. Marianne kind of gives a play-by-play -play about Iowa, her analysis on it, and why privatization, privatization is this looming issue that no other candidate is particularly talking about. You think about the government in eminent domain and gobbling up native land, gobbling up land of people who have been living in a community for 50 years. And now, you know, before his eminent domain, but now everything is essentially getting privatized by the government. And, and it's becoming this slippery slope where, okay, first is an aspect of health care, then it might be energy, what else? And some, the government is incompetent half the time, so you have to recognize that. But some of this ultra-privatization can be very dangerous, and it's this trend that only Marianne Williamson is really paying attention to. So I enjoyed her thoughts about this as well. And the Koch brothers, and remember the Koch brothers are the ones who are even today, well, one of them has died, but the Koch brother of the Koch Foundation, is the one who gave $10 million to Nikki Haley. By the way, I want to point out something else. Last, this has been a $175 million raise in Iowa. So Vivek Ramaswamy, for instance, he's a very wealthy mayor. It all came to naught yesterday. Mm -hmm. So it's not all about money. Mm -hmm. Right? So I thought that was really interesting. Anyway, um, uh, so the Koch brothers said, oh, and they started funding. I mean, this was all strategized. If you read uh, um, Sheldon Winehouse, Whitehouse's book about the Supreme Court, how they had this plan, how they were going to take over the Supreme Court for corporatist uh, 
um, forces and so forth. So we ended up with a situation in which it's basically privatized everything because private, private money, private power, private control is about the accumulation of wealth. The public good, the, but the first principle of the United States that is supposed to be operative here is that it is the government's role to broker the balance between uh, private opportunity, uh, liberty, which includes economic liberty. Yeah, you can, you can start that, that factory if you want to, good on you. But it's the government's to balance economic liberty, any liberty, personal individual liberty with a concern for the common good. So the way it was supposed to work is your individual liberty means you can start that factory. Concern for the common good means no, you cannot spew carcinogens into the river. But we become so imbalanced in the direction of the protection of private property and privatization, everything's become about privatization. And as it becomes more and more about privatization, so how do you make it about privatization? You deregulate. I mean, how do you concern, uh, uh, provide for the common good? Providing for the common good means environmental regulations. Providing for the common good means safety regulations. Providing for the common good means more money to things like health care and education. Uh, providing for the common good uh, means recognizing the importance of the public domain, which by definition means things you don't have to pay for and which most people might not be able to pay for, but which create a thriving society. So I read this book called uh, Democracy, no, yeah, the, Garden, the, the Gardens of Democracy, and it used this really powerful image. It said that what's happening now is like if all the blood in the body went to one arm. Blood has to circulate, opportunity has to circulate, money has to circulate. The problem in, in America is not that some people get to get rich, but not enough people even get to get beyond what they feel they have to do just to make it. You can't, you can't, that's a collapse of a middle class. You can't have a thriving democracy when you don't have a thriving middle class. And then here I talked with a New Hampshire voter who showed up and who was on the county committee of uh, a key county in New Hampshire, the county Democratic Committee. So she was certainly a significant player in the Democratic Party. But she was inspired by Marianne, but got all of this guff. So you can see how the establishment, even in local New Hampshire, can turn against you if you decide not to support Biden. So there's this very deliberate effort to silence anybody running against Biden with Marianne uniquely in the crosshairs. And it's easy to see why, because if more people heard her, if more they'd find her relatable, they'd find her likable, they'd find her charismatic, they'd find her innovative and they probably want to vote for her over Joe Biden. Uh, and they, they, they would also find that she is not a zombie uh, and that she has energy and she does not seem like she has dementia. And as I mentioned before, she's only about eight years younger than Biden or something like that, but she, it feels like she's 40 years younger. It doesn't feel like there's uh, any uh, significance. So yeah, man, I, you know, as, as somebody who uh, personally, I know I have a lot of Trump fans that have subscribed as somebody who does not want to see Trump back in office. I want the strongest Democrat that is either Dean Phillips or Marianne Williamson. Uh, I would say Marianne probably would be the strongest because Marianne is more of an impetus or her, her, uh, advocacy, for example, for, uh, uh, healthcare, uh, for universal healthcare. Dean Phillips is not as extreme is not as progressive on the issue. Another one is the ceasefire in Gaza. Dean Phillips is not reflexively at all uh, pro-Israel and wants to look at the issue and is not, you know, jumping on the APAC ship. But at the same time, he is not called for a ceasefire. And Marianne Williamson, if you're progressive and if you, you feel uh, identify with the progressives on that issue, Israel and Palestine, Marianne is by far the most progressive candidate. So Dean, Dean is, even though he's running a good campaign, he's still kind of this corporatist, moderate, neoconservative Democrat. Marianne Williamson in the Democratic Party is really the one candidate who's not a neoconservative running. Uh, and I would say there are two, well, I would say Trump is actually a neoconservative if you look at his foreign policy. So, and Nikki Haley certainly is the definition of a neoconservative. So she might be the only one that's, that's not. So I, I, I found that very interesting. But yeah, you can see how uh, the, the hostility that this voter encountered simply for supporting uh, her candidate quite frankly. And 
it's this deliberate blackout, this deliberate attempt to stamp out democracy. And that's why I'm trying to make these videos to inform some of my audience. It's not just Joe Biden that's running. Here are some other interesting candidates who you could actually vote for. And and uh, people have made this argument that pass, oh, if you vote for Dean Phillips or you vote for Marion Williamson, then that means that's a vote for Biden. And I say bullshit because you could vote for Phillips or Marianne in the primary and they'll probably lose. And guess what? You can vote for Biden in the general election. It's not going to hurt him. So this, this, you know, uh, or a vote for Trump. Yeah, vote, a vote for Marianne and Dean is not a vote for Trump. That doesn't make any sense. And quite frankly, if any of them get momentum, then either one of them exponentially would be a 1,000% a better nominee and a better president than Joe Biden. I do not think Joe Biden has been a good president. Just because I don't want Trump doesn't mean I think that Joe Biden has been a good president. So both of these candidates... They have better moral character. They're better on the issues. They relate better to voters. Their minds are sharper. They're more charismatic. And either Mar uh, either Marianne Williamson or Dean Phillips would mop the floor with Trump. It, right now, because it's Trump, would mop the floor with Biden, with Trump. Right now, because it's Trump and he's the least popular candidate for the general election, I hate to say it, guys, sorry, Nikki Haley is doing much better against Trump. I mean, much better against Biden. The Trump is, I mean, the fact that, that, that Trump is only beating Biden by two points, that's still a race. That's a seesaw. Everybody says, oh, it's guaranteed that uh, Trump is certainly going to win. You're only ahead two or three points. I think if it was Trump versus any of these guys, then uh, they'd beat Trump by 15 to 20 points. I don't, I don't think it would be particularly close. But this is what happens when the elitist and the corporate structure and the neoconservatives try to hijack the party. And they've, and they've, they've been hijacked, they've hijacked the, well, they've, they've hijacked the party since the Tammany Hall days. So this is nothing new, but people keep trying to push back and now it's becoming a lot more visible. So that's the difference. Part of the Democratic Committee, right, in New Hampshire? No, I was. And, and so, so what happened? Why, why do you leave? I left yeah. because of the manipulation by the National Party. Uh, it, it had no reflection on my local committee. I am still friendly with mo all of the people uh, yeah, on that committee. You know, there, there were no hard feelings there. There, but I did not want my name connected with the National Party. Makes sense. Their behavior. And then you showed up to a Marion Williamson event initially not in support of her, right? Um, Apparently. No, well, I, I wanted to hear. She had to say, right? I like to get my information firsthand. Yeah. And what was the reaction that you got from some people in the party committee that when you said you're supporting Marianne? In 2019, um, I actually had one of my fellow members point to me and say she has no business running. And I said, this is a democracy. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, it was surprising. It was very surprising. So I hope you enjoyed that. Again, uh, send me a comment if you want the full Marianne Town Hall uh, with better audio uh, that I have with my DSLR camera. Thank you guys. As always, things are busy, busy, busy. Tomorrow uh, at 7 p.m. is a Nikki Haley rally. I doubt I could shoot the shit with Nikki Haley like I was able to shoot the shit with Marianne today, which is a hell of a lot of fun. It makes me like her even more. But it'll be interesting to uh, comment on the environment and interview some voters. But this, one's, this one might be kind of a cool one for you because you see some of my input and you really get this up-close personal view. So I, I'm kind of glad no, not a lot of people attended because I really – actually got to have this back and forth conversation with her. And that's kind of the fun of democracy. Don't ignore it. Pay attention. Research all the candidates. I always make the joke, even, even Asa Hutchinson. Asa Hutchinson dropped out, sadly, because I was actually, I was going to go to an Asa Hutchinson event, but he has dropped out. Looks like DeSantis is largely skipping New Hampshire. Don't know what's happening with that. And then Cenk Uger is the, the other Democrat who's not serious because he's not actually campaigning. He's not campaigning in New Hampshire. So I don't think Cenk is a real candidate. You actually have to go to New Hampshire, have a few events. And he had to get humbled, man. That's I kind of respect Marianne. Sometimes you got to get egg in your face. you got to get seven people at an event. And that's kind of what brings you closer to the people and humbles you. So nothing wrong with that. But thank you guys for your continued interest, for your continued support. I know some of you will unsubscribe and that's okay. You can't please them all. I got a lot of new subscribers because I do find Vivek Ramaswamy to be an interesting character and to stand for a lot of good things, even though I don't like Trump. So got some new uh, stuff from that. But then they didn't like that I said nice things about Haley, but I'm really just calling it as I, as I see it. And of course, I'm 
also giving my my viewpoint as as an interested voter and giving my own personal point of view but in terms of strategy in terms of how this race is going to shape up uh, I'm just trying to be as objective as possible and then I add add my own little input as to what I'm personally thinking but uh, I tend to be objective and look at each candidate individually and again I, I, I tend to give most people who are not the overdogs the benefit of the doubt and I, I just hate the overdogs I don't I don't like uh, not a fan of Trump I remember I was five years old in the election in 1996 we had a kindergarten mock election and I voted for Ross Perot and everybody else uh, most people voted for uh, Bill Clinton and a couple kids voted for um, uh, Bob Dole and I said well I don't I they're all voting for those people well why not C why why is it only A and B so ever since I was five years old I thought you know what my mission in life is to talk about C and promote C and, and show that there is a third way so that's always been my approach to politics ever since I was about five years old and could even really think about it um, so if you get the only slant you'll get from me would be an anti-establishment uh, pro renegade stance I like the renegades I'm a bit of a renegade myself that's why I tussle with Scientology so that's in my blood and I I, I I admire the mission when people are also embarking on that in their own way so thank you guys again for your support and I appreciate it and I will see you tomorrow for Nikki Haley take care bye bye